Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Dr. Thomas Hemingway here. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss out. So here we are, the month of May. I wanted to share with you this very important topic of our brain, how to keep our brain healthy and to prevent dementia because dementia is sadly increasing throughout the world. It is super common. In fact, I'm going to share some statistics with you, but I want to just cut to the chase that there is something we can do about this. When I did my medical training over 25 years ago in medical school, when we studied dementia and we learned about the amyloid theory, the tau proteins and all of that that you've heard of that may not be all that helpful with respect to this because we now know that a lot of the research that was done was a little bit, uh, let's just call it flawed. In fact, a recent study in 2022 in the journal Science just last summer uh, called out this uh, really landmark study that came out in 2006 that actually had falsified some information about the amyloid plaques and these proteins. And we know that Literally billions of dollars have been spent on medications targeting specifically the amyloid protein, and none of them have really worked. So it's crazy, crazy stuff. It's a it's a pretty wild, wild history when you go back to, I think it was 1906 when it was first discovered, and just all the places the research has gone. But anyway, we're going to focus on today more than that. We're going to focus on what we actually can do to prevent dementia in ourselves, our family members, and how we can even get tested for some things that will potentially increase our risk and to, so we can know how to plan and how to really be able to take our health in our own hands. First of all, I wanted to share some statistics with you. In the US right now today, over six and a half million, nearly 7 million people have currently been diagnosed with dementia, specifically Alzheimer's uh, dementia. There's there's about 10 million or more in the US with dementia, but specifically Alzheimer's, we're coming up on 7 million here in the US. And in the world, 55 million people worldwide have dementia and 70% of them are estimated to have Alzheimer's. So it is super, super common, the most common type of dementia. And really the, the symptoms, as you all know, are memory loss primarily is what you first start noticing. That's probably the key symptom of Alzheimer's. It affects that sort of medial temporal lobe, the hippocampus, which is the area of the brain responsible for memory. And initially, it might be something really simple, right? We kind of joke about this. I know even I have already because I too often misplace my keys or my phone. Maybe you guys have done the same. And uh, so it, it, it's on my mind because, you know, I'm turning 50 soon. You guys know this. And, and uh, you know, I have these moments that uh, sometimes I know in the ER, we call them senior moments, if you will. And they, they are starting to affect people younger and younger. And we really need to be paying attention to a lot of these early signs because this is a disease process that many of us will be prone to. And like I said, is the most common cause of dementia unless we choose to do something about it. And there actually is a lot of things that we can do, which is really super, super exciting. In fact, one thing I wanted to share with you right out of the gates, because it is <laughs> probably the number one thing that we can do to prevent not only Alzheimer's dementia, but all of the dementia is moving our body. Actually, exercise has been really the only thing universally helpful for both the prevention and even helps people who already have any of these dementias, the movement or the exercise is critical. You know what's cool about exercise is that it actually causes the brain to grow, to grow new connections, to establish new neuronal synapses and connections, specifically that area of the brain that is targeted in the dementias, especially the Alzheimer's type, which is that medial temporal lobe called the hippocampus, that's the memory center. When we do exercise, 
that area of the brain actually lights up. And that sort of brain uh, steroid, if you will, the natural one called brain derived neurotrophic factor actually gets increased and it targets that specific area of the brain called the hippocampus and actually causes it to grow, to wake up, to revitalize, to establish new synapses, neuronal connections with specifically exercise. And it happens with both aerobic exercise as well as resistance training. In fact, one of the things that has been correlated with um, less of a risk of getting dementia as you get older is right here. And those of you that are watching on YouTube, you're going to see I have one of those grip strengthening devices. And I actually, I have a couple of sets of these. I keep them all over the house because I don't know about you. I'm just a little, little bit antsy ADHD. I can't sit still very long. In fact, I'm podcasting to you right now, standing up. And I like to kind of fidget a little bit instead of a fidget spinner, which is what my kids have gotten over the years. I have one of these grip strength devices. <laughs> Excuse me. Which I love to just get a little, you know, quick fix exercise as I do this. And many of you know, I had this hand injury about a year ago, and this was literally the thing that got my hand back in shape. And it's still a little bit lacking. It's not quite where it should be. I'm still healing from that, but this grip strength exercise has been tremendously helpful for me. And interestingly enough, the Likelihood, as I mentioned, of the dementias goes down with increased grip strength. That's one of these kind of universal truths as you age. Grip strength is kind of this measure of, of health and physical activity, and it's directly correlated in these studies with increasing strength here, and the grip strength is correlated with decreasing risk for not only Alzheimer's and the dementia, the dementias, but a lot of the other diseases of sort of the elderly age, if you will. You know, a lot of us have heard of a lot of these sort of common pathways that uh, as we age, we get what's called sarcopenia, which is that kind of age-related muscle loss or muscle wasting, losing muscle as we age, which actually I, I, I love to share that it is not, it is not something that has to happen. It is not something irrefutable, undeniable, or something in the cards for all of us. It, it actually can be effectively changed. You can change your course in your own history and not get sarcopenia and not get that if you are moving your body, you are doing body weight or resistance training activities, these kinds of things, it does not have to happen to you. So that's the exciting thing. I don't know if you guys have seen this amazing woman on Instagram. Her name is Joan. Uh, her hashtag is uh, train with Joan. And she literally started getting really active in her 70s. I think she's in her 80s now, but she is remarkable. And she made this change very late in life. So it's never too late to start doing something like this, moving your body, getting a standing desk, doing some air squats or lunges or my favorite, the plank. It is never too late. So don't write yourself off. You've got this. Do something each and every day to move your body. And that is actually one of the most effective, most consistently mentioned in all the research studies as being the most critical, helpful, and useful for preventing dementia or the brain neurodegenerative diseases, including actually Parkinson's, Lewy body dementia. These also decrease with incidence with exercise and just being physically active. And so that is exciting for me because one of the things I love more than anything is just moving my body. I just, I can't sit still. I love to move in all sorts of ways, whether it be on the mountain slopes in the winter or the waves and the other times of the year when I get out to the beach and with my kids, the movement, ah, every, you guys know, if you watch me on Instagram, we are dancing after meal, our bodies, we are just active and it's exciting. It's fun. And the community that you can build with those that you move with, whether it be family or friends, in a group exercise class at a gym or on a bike ride or a walk or a sport that involves a couple of people, whether it be tennis or basketball, my kids love basketball or whatever. It's uh, it's so fun to move your body. So that's my number one hack for preventing dementia is with exercise. And it's, it's actually, 
it makes sense because what happens with exercise, not only does that brain derived neurotrophic factor go up, but also exercise improves blood flow. And now kind of one of the working theories on what may be causative in the dementias is reduced or diminished, decreased blood flow because we need blood going to the brain, right? The brain is hungry. I don't know if you guys know this, but the brain is only occupying about 2%. That's two, one, two, two percent of our body weight. Yet it requires about 20% of the blood flow and the metabolic energy, you know, the, the fuel, if you will, the brain is a hungry, hungry organ. And if it doesn't get fed, it doesn't work well. And the cool thing is the brain works well off of a couple of different fuels. It works well, obviously off glucose and ketones, ketones fuel the brain remarkably. And we've talked a lot about ketones in previous podcasts and how if we're doing an intermittent fast, for example, or a prolonged fast where we're not having any caloric intake, the ketones are what keeps our brain going in addition to the liver making some glucose through the process of gluconeogenesis. But what is really interesting about the sort of newer theories of Alzheimer's, not focusing so much on the amyloid and the tau, which haven't totally panned out in the most recent research as be either, being either causative or a target for therapeutics because none of the therapeutics targeting the amyloid have really worked despite billions of dollars spent. But what does work is actually increasing blood flow to the brain through exercise. It's one great way. Another one is through getting the nutrients the brain needs by being insulin sensitive. You know, that insulin resistance, which is the opposite of insulin sensitivity is sadly really, really common in the Western world. In the US, uh, upwards of 80 some odd percent, coming up on 90% of us have some degree of insulin resistance, which is not a good thing. This is kind of like a very early precursor to type two diabetes, which is rising both in kids and adults. And in fact, many have even started to cause, excuse me, started to call Alzheimer's dementia type three diabetes, because those who do have diabetes, especially type two, are at a higher risk. In fact, two, almost threefold higher risk of developing dementia later in life if you have type two diabetes. But you know what's cool about type two diabetes is you can change that. It can literally be cured, reversed entirely in a couple of simple steps. And, and I've talked about this in previous podcasts. Check out the one I did with Dr. Benjamin Bickman, and then several I did after that on how to get insulin sensitive. It's a real fun topic I don't have time to get into today, but but the, the quick and short story is you gotta stop eating the highly processed sugars and the carbohydrates that are highly processed, the grains, the flours that are very highly processed, the simple sugars, the high fructose corn syrup, doesn't matter if it's cane sugar, if it's brown rice syrup, it doesn't matter, all of these are sugar. So we gotta back off on the sugar. and. You guys know me, I pretty much only get my sugar through natural means like fruit. I love fruit. Coming from Hawaii, I mean, come on. The mangoes, the pineapples, the papaya, they are all over the place and I still love to eat them and I eat them whole. I don't drink the juice because as many of you know, especially any that have used the CGM as I have and as my daughter does continuously, the juices go bananas with spiking the blood sugar because they're devoid of the fiber that uh, delays that spike. So anyway, short story is vascular disease is one of the risk factors for Alzheimer's. Big surprise, right? And all the dementias, decreased blood flow, not a good thing. So at the end of the day, not only do we want great blood flow to prevent dementia, but of course we want great blood flow for our heart. So what's good for our heart is also good for the brain and also for the dudes out there, it's good for your downstairs, right? You wanna, wanna have good blood flow there as well. So doing things like exercise, doing things like reducing your insulin resistance through eating well, real whole natural foods, kind of eliminating the snacking for the most part and really sticking to eating foods that don't raise your glucose and insulin too much. That's a good sort of first step because insulin resistance is a major risk factor for not only diabetes, of course, but for Alzheimer's dementia, which many have even coined, you know, the new type three diabetes, which is not a good thing because it's getting more and more common. But what's in, in, 
interesting about um, Alzheimer's is that in the brain, it has been shown that in Alzheimer's, there is a defective glucose metabolism and there's issues with insulin. Because in the brain, what is super interesting is like I mentioned just a few minutes ago, the brain is hungry. It is super hungry for its size, right? 2% of the body weight, yet 20% of the nutrients and blood flow are going to the brain. So it's a hungry organ. It wants its fuel. And if you have insulin resistance, it has a harder time getting the energy, either glucose or ketones, either it has a hard time supplying the brain with sufficient energy because of this insulin resistance. And in fact, one of the newer therapies is super interesting. I just learned about this recently. They have tried nasal, that's through the nose, nasal sprays of insulin in folks that already have Alzheimer's dementia, and that has actually improved cognition which kind of makes sense because most of these people are somewhat insulin resistant. And one of the ways is to give them more insulin because the insulin they have is not working well. This is not a curative thing. You know, it's better to prevent insulin resistance in the first place, but it actually provides more data backing this sort of theory of the impaired, you know, glucose and insulin um, in the brain with, with Alzheimer's and the dementia. So get your brain healthy by reducing your insulin resistance by eating real foods, kind of getting rid of the sugars, right? Especially the highly processed stuff and by spacing out your meals. Don't be snacking all day long. And if you do have to snack, reach for an avocado or something, which is my favorite go-to or a handful of nuts, whether it be in Hawaii, it's macadamia. And when I'm not there and I can't get them, it's a handful of pistachios or cashews or what have you. So that I found super interesting, this sort of impaired glucose and insulin function in the brain in the Alzheimer's dementia patients, which is sort of this continuum between type two diabetes leading towards Alzheimer's dementia. As I mentioned about a threefold higher risk, but the take home point is this can be prevented. Type two diabetes can be prevented. And if you already have it, or if you have the earlier stages of glucose, you know, elevation called hyperglycemia or insulin resistance, that can be completely reversed. So take a look at my previous podcast on that. It's a wonderful thing. It is in your control. There is something you can do, C-A-N, do about it. The other thing I wanted to mention is there's a couple of blood tests out there that can be helpful in getting them done so that you have more information, right? Knowledge is power, really potential power, but it kind of gives you some idea of your risk because there are certain families, certain folks out there that do have some genetic uh, predisposition to dementia, specifically Alzheimer's. If you have a couple of copies of what's called the little E for allele. So this is APOE, that's APO capital E, APOE, that's the apolipoprotein E. And if you have two copies of the little E4, they often just call that APOE4, you do have a several fold higher risk of potentially developing Alzheimer's dementia. It does not mean that you will get it because there are plenty of people who have that genotype, two of the copies of the, of the E4, the little E4, APOE, that do not get Alzheimer's. So it's not a death sentence, if you will. It's not guaranteeing that you'll get Alzheimer's, but there's definitely an increased incidence in those folks that have that. So if you've never had your APOE, specifically the E4 allele checked, it's something your doctor could do. Um, I like to add to that the APOB, right? Because that's super helpful to find out with respect to you know heart disease and heart disease risk. And the LP little a, that's lipoprotein little a, LP little a. I like to do those all together. And this is a little bit of a sort of higher tech cholesterol panel, if you will, because if you just go and get your LDL and that's it, that's not going to get you enough information. So ask your doctor for these specific tests, including APOB, APOE, as well as LP little a, because it'll tell you about your risk of both heart disease as well as uh, Alzheimer's. And it can be done rather simply. And these are not super expensive tests, should be less than a hundred bucks. It's not crazy. They've been around for a long time. But sadly, just like with the fasting insulin that almost no doctors do, it is so dang useful and helpful and it's available. And the technology has been around for decades. It's not a new thing, but it is available and it can be very helpful because I really feel like knowledge is power. There's actually, a, it's a super interesting phenomenon, but the history behind the APOE 
uh, E4 specifically allele is that there was a time, historically speaking, where that was actually a really good thing. And this was back, you know, maybe hundreds, even thousands of years ago when we were much more prone to infections. The folks that had the two copies of the little E4, the ApoE4 allele, tended to be less likely to get. Or, or I should say, die from infectious diseases because the body was able to ramp up inflammation quite a bit better. And then nowadays that we have antibiotics and we're not dying of infectious disease like we were, you know, millennia ago and decade and and hundreds of years ago, it's it's not as useful to have two copies of that E4 allele because we've noticed that that's had increased risks for Alzheimer's dementia. And one of those reasons may be because it is inflammatory promoting or pro-inflammatory. And that's, of course, one of the, I think, root causes of just about every disease out there is inflammation, right? And insulin resistance, as we've talked about already in this podcast, is a pro-inflammatory state. So some other things that we can do preventatively prophylactically, you know, to prevent these kinds of things is to reduce the inflammation in our life, both in our diet, in our exposures, whether it be high stress situations, being around inflammatory people, whatever that is, reducing inflammation will not only help preventing lots of disease, including insulin resistance, heart disease, but also the dementias because they are inflammatory in nature. So having both an anti-inflammatory diet, as you know, which can Sis of a real foods, whole foods, single ingredient type foods diet, you know, devoid of all these highly processed foods that come in a bag or in a box or with a barcode, avoiding those. And the big three that I love to remind us all the highly processed sugar, of course, the highly processed flours and grains, and the highly processed industrialized oils, right? All of those seed oils that are highly processed are super pro inflammatory. And so if we can reduce, reduce that consumption in our diet and do the things that are anti-inflammatory, like movement, exercise, also all of the phenomenal tools out there for stress reduction, whether it be breath work, you know, it's, it's one of those things that can change our physiology in a moment. Just a couple of breaths, you can change from being in that wired, sympathetic fight or flight state to a restful, at ease parasympathetic state through just a couple of breaths, whether it be the Wim Hof method or box breathing, or there's so many methods out there, or just, just breathing slowly, deep breath in. I try to do the breath out a little bit longer, do five or six of those. That's about a minute. And your entire physiology can completely change or adding in things like meditation or mindfulness. Those can be super phenomenal in the anti-inflammatory sense. Um, I just wanted to bust out a little bit more of the uh, data here for you because I think that's just super interesting. Um, so let me share with you the uh, the notion that having the ApoE4 allele, even if you have two copies, like I said, it is not a death sentence. It is not going to you know be definitive because some people with two copies of the E4 never get dementia, never get Alzheimer's at all. And so in, in those folks who have that, don't be like super bummed out or super alarmed because there's actually a lot that you can do. It is not a death sentence if you have two copies of the E4. Definitely, I think we'll urge you and give you some impetus to even be more proactive. Start earlier with your exercise on a daily basis, with your anti-inflammatory diet and practicing these other um, stress reduction and anti-inflammatory behaviors like meditation, mindfulness, breath work, breathing, all of those things are amazing. There's, there's also even some supplements that can be greatly helpful. Many of you have heard me talk about my favorite su supplements. Two of my favorites actually have been shown to be related to be decreasing the incidence of Alzheimer's and the dementias. And these two are healthy Omega-3 fats, these are things like in fish oil or in, if you like roe, fish roe, the eggs themselves. I, I tend to just like fresh fish, whether it be the small ones, the sardines. I, I got this amazing type of sardine when we were in Portugal and I am like addicted. They are so tasty, so yummy. If I'm in Hawaii, I'm getting fresh fish. Um, 
but you can get that those omega um, omega threes that way through fish, um, or you can you can take a supplement. But they have been shown to decrease the likelihood of Alzheimer's as well as my other super favorite vitamin, as you know, vitamin D. We can get that often in the summer and spring where I am for free from the sun. Or I do take a vitamin D supplement. In fact, this year I've been taking it for several months because I've been in the mountains for most of the winter and not getting very much vitamin D. But having vitamin D has shown elevated levels in the blood has been shown to decrease your risk as far as its association with the dementias and Alzheimer's. So I wanted to mention that. Um, and then I wanted to also talk about a couple others that uh, I think are super interesting with respect to um, the uh, the other prevention techniques as well. And basically, like I mentioned, anything that encourages insulin sensitivity and a better functioning metabolism will also improve your chances of not getting Alzheimer's disease. So trying to be insulin sensitive is super important. Um, we talked about omega-3, especially um, DHA that helps with brain health just in general. As you know, the brain is a fatty organ. It loves fat. In fact, most of a big chunk of the body's cholesterol goes to the brain because the brain loves it. The brain is made up of largely fat. <laughs> And if we can have the ratio of the omega-3s higher in our diet than the omega-6s, our ratio in the US and most of the developed world are completely backwards. We have way more omega-6 than omega-3. And that's because of all these seed oils that we've been exposed to that are in almost everything that comes in a bag, a box, or with a barcode, all of those highly processed industrialized oils. We need to get our omega-3 intake up almost universally, um, DHA and EPA super, super important. Um, and then we need to be flexible. Metabolically speaking, I did a whole podcast on metabolic flexibility. If you haven't heard that one, go back and re-listen because we talk about how we can shift between a carbohydrate metabolism to primarily a fat uh, or lipid metabolism using the fuel called ketones, which I mentioned early on in this podcast, which can actually fuel the brain tremendously well. The brain actually loves ketones. And in fact, they've even studied ketogenic diets in folks that have already been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and it actually improves their cognitive function. And I'm not saying that we should all be in ketosis, but it's not a bad thing to go in and out of. And I, I do that from time to time. I, in fact, did like two to three years of strict ketosis, and that was a little bit much for me. Now I cycle in and out of it, and I find that to be a little bit more helpful because I'm not having negative effects on my hormones that way, and doing too much of, of ketosis and super low carb or no carb was affecting me adversely in that way. And if you haven't heard my story, check out my podcast on that. But I, I think going in and out of ketosis is a good thing. Um, but as I mentioned, the, the best things overall for prevention are things we easily can do each and every day, primarily movement, moving our body, both with aerobic exercise and strength training. Both of those have been shown to be super helpful. The other thing I haven't talked about yet in this podcast, one of my favorite things to share about is getting appropriate and restful sleep. Because if you remember when you sleep, some magic happens, really cool stuff called autophagy. It's sort of the cellular cleanup and taking out the trash and the refreshing and getting rid of the toxins, including things like amyloid and tau that have been associated with Alzheimer's, getting rid of those and all the other toxins that build up during the course of the day. And as you know, many of us are exposed to whether we know it or not, literally thousands of toxins on a daily basis, many of them through our water, through the plastic bottles, through, you know, the air we breathe, all of the things we get exposed to besides the common ones we think about, like the glyphosate in a lot of our foods from the non-organic you know, organic foods that have pesticides on them, things like that. But if we can optimize our sleep, that is one of the best things for our brains because during sleep, we have this beautiful process of autophagy, which is the cellular cleanup. It's the removal of all the debris, the broken down cells, all the garbage, if you will, gets flushed out each and every night while we were both sleeping and not eating. And it's been shown to actually be helpful in preventing dementia as well. And one of the first things that goes, many of you who have had relatives that have either cognitive impairment or full-on Alzheimer's or other dementias, their sleep is chaotic, it's disrupted, 
And it is, it just makes the disease even advance even more because they're not getting appropriate sleep. And, and whether it be causative or not, it's been associated with the dementias. If you're not getting good sleep, what's super interesting is it can start fairly early on as early as your forties. If you're not getting good sleep, that can actually put you at risk for getting some of these challenges later in life, including dementia. And so I'm so grateful that I finally realized in my forties that sleep was paramount. Sleep should be our superpower because many of you know, I used to have the mindset and the approach that I'll just sleep when I'm dead. I'm too busy. I got too much stuff to do. I'm a doctor. I can't afford to sleep. I cannot afford not to sleep. I need to sleep. I cherish my sleep. My wife knows this. I, I wear one of these aura ring type watches with monitors for my sleep. And you know, I wear it most of the time and it, uh, <laughs> it's it's a blessing and a curse. Sometimes I, I specifically don't look at the number because you know when you wake up when you've had a really crappy sleep. But I, I tell you this because sleep is paramount. And in fact, there is data on it. I wanted to share with you. There's a trial called the Achieve Trial, Aging and Cognitive Health Evaluation in Elders. It's currently ongoing and it actually talks about these things. And it's really cool. Um really cool because it, it, it incorporates all these things we've talked about. One of the other things that I'll just mention as we get close to wrapping up, which is not intuitive, but it's something that is really fun and super easy to do each and every day. And that is brushing and flossing your teeth. Yes, you heard it right here. Bless, <laughs> brushing and flossing your teeth can actually help decrease the chances that you will get dementia. Good oral health, good oral hygiene has been associated with decreased risk of not only heart disease, big surprise, but also dementia, because now we're thinking that they are both vascular diseases. And if we do not take care of our oral health, it is shown to be once again, super inflammatory and it affects the blood vessels. In fact, there's even, this is, this is, I know this sounds kind of fringe, but it's even been shown that there's a specific bacteria called P. gingivalis, and that's the one that's associated with gingivitis, big surprise, that's actually been found in the brains of Alzheimer's disease patients, legit, in the brains of Alzheimer's disease patients, this P. gingivalis. And so we cannot afford to ignore our dental health. And this, this is the part that makes my family proud. I have so many dentists in my family, my father, my stepfather, my brother. So we... We go off on, on uh, the oral hygiene and how paramount and important it is. And in fact, I did a fun episode with Nadine Artemis um, on a lot of this with dental health and hygiene and, and sort of my approach to the natural uh, techniques there to maintain amazing dental health because it's important, but simply you got to brush, you got to floss, right? There's that old adage, that might, you know, you ask your dentist, well, well, how often do I need to floss or which teeth do I need to floss when he says, or she says, well, you only have to floss the ones that you want to keep, right? Well, I want to keep all of my teeth <laughs> because I love food. I love eating. I'm a great eater. As you guys know, I love to sample all the cuisines, but I realize even more that dental health or our oral health and hygiene is critical, not only in our overall body health, but preventing dementia. So you heard it here. <laughs> Some other things that uh, we'll just wrap with some supplements that can be helpful are the B vitamins. They can be super helpful, especially in decreasing what's called your homocysteine. If you haven't checked that, you got to check that as well. Getting methylated folate into your vitamin mix is paramount. If you need some suggestions, I have a great methylated folate that I take. Um, super important for the B vitamins, getting that in proper balance and getting rid of the, and dramatically reducing the homocysteine, which has also been shown to cause heart disease or be correlated with that. So you want to make sure you're getting adequate B vitamins. We talked about the omegas. We talked about vitamin D also in those that are approaching the menopause and perimenopause ages, uh, for the women out there having, you know, the, the, what I, what I like to use is the bioidentical hormone replacement has been helpful as well, because, um, they think that with the drop in estrogen around menopause, that can be increasing risk for some of the dementias. And so bioidentical hormone replacement, if you need that, that's one of the things I also reach for, but, uh, that's the wrap for the prevention, the easy stuff. Remember what's good for the good for the heart, you know, is good for the brain, the exercise, both aerobic uh, and strength training, 
And number two is decreasing inflammation because now we're learning that inflammation is at the root of some of these. In fact, most diseases, including Alzheimer's and the dementias, they, dementias are inflammatory diseases. So decreasing inflammation in our life, starting with our diet, also our environment, the things that we're exposed to, the people that we're around, decreasing inflammation, all of those stress reduction things that we talked about. And then of course the real and whole foods diet and decreasing our insulin resistance. We talked a lot about that earlier, super important. That's mostly done through diet. Also, it's done through timing our meals, timing our foods, having some breaks between meals, having that overnight circadian fast that I often share about. So, so important, not only for decreasing our insulin resistance, but also so that we can get this magic to happen each and every night called autophagy, right? The cellular cleanup, the take out the trash that can only occur while we are sleeping and not eating. And that is paramount. So you got to treasure value and really prioritize your sleep. And that's something, sadly, I, it's taken me half my life, actually more than half of my life to realize that. And I'm using it now as my superpower. Sleep is my new superpower. And I would not go anywhere without it. <laughs> so remember that uh, these things are doable. They are available. They're not difficult, but we got to do it. God, we just got to do it. We got to get up and move our body each and every day. We got to do some resistance training. Remember that uh, uh, my, my little tool here, my fidget, get yourself one of these, these little fidget tools, <laughs> which is the grip strength the exercises and just be doing that. I, I literally have them all over the house. I think my drives my wife crazy. She just found a few of mine in the kitchen. <laughs> I often do some work standing at the kitchen counter because I, I just can't sit still. But having, having these exercises, resistance training, an anti-inflammatory diet and lifestyle, optimal sleep. And then of course, the vitamins we mentioned, omega-3s, vitamin D, the B vitamins, especially methylated folate. And if you don't know how to get these, just message me. I'd love to share with you my program. It's just been phenomenal for my own health and thousands and thousands of others that I've worked with. And, and uh, I just, I'm just so grateful for you guys. I'm so grateful. And I'm just glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're just sharing with us, that you're part of this movement. Just remember that prevention is possible. You are not destined to get this dementia, whether it be Alzheimer's or Lewy body or vascular dementia. That is not your destiny. You actually are in control. Even if you have two copies of that APOE, the little E4 allele, you don't have to get dementia. You can prevent it with these techniques and it's beautiful, it's practical and it is within your power. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. I just love you guys. I'm so grateful for you. I had so much fun just reading up, getting sort of the latest and greatest on the dementias because it is Mental Health Awareness Month. It's May and your brain is so important. It is an organ. You got to exercise it. I didn't even get to that part, but <laughs> doing brain exercise is super important. And it's not just doing crossword puzzles. Sorry for all those that love crossword puzzles. They're great, but they've actually only been shown to help you do better at crossword puzzles. It's, it's not enough. You got to do different and new things. It's always great to learn new things, learn a new instrument, practice a new movement. A balancing movement is really helpful. You know me, I'm always moving, whether it be on a board or hiking or whatever it is on a bike. I'm so excited. We're going to get some melted snow here soon, and I'll be able to get back on my bike again. I'm going to Hawaii as well. I'm going to get back in the water and surf. So moving your body is so critical, and oh, it's one of my best things for mental health as well. There's nothing like that high that you get from your natural neuroendocrine hormones that are released with exercise. Oh my gosh. The natural endocannabinoids they're called. Anyway, get out there and move, shout this out on social media, share it with a friend or family member, anybody that might be concerned about dementia, let them know that there is something that they can do and make sure to reach out to me, Dr. Thomas Hemingway. And until next time, aloha.